when we talk about Mother's Day, I, I, I've got a lot of things that we could talk about. We could go through a lot of different uh, ladies in the biblical narrative and tell their story. We could talk about Ruth. We could talk about Deborah. We could talk about Sarah. We could talk about Mary, Martha. We could talk about a, an apostle named Junius. We could talk about a deaconess named Phoebe. We could talk about Mary, Martha. So many great ladies that we could talk about on this day. But we're going to talk about the most important person in my life when it's a growing up and as a kid, and that is my mom. So good luck with this. We're going to talk about Granny Gert today, and I hope this is something that you will find encouraging and find some strength with. There are four things that my mother was kind of famous for saying in her journey of life, and you've got, if you've got your bulletin, you can look at what I wrote down there. You don't need to write these down. They're written down there for you, but four quick things I want you to think about. First is this. Thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Second one. If you can look up, you can get up. Third one, Lord, get me out of this car. And fourth one, pray until there's a smile on my face. Now, when we talk about our moms and our grandmas and our aunts and our sisters and wives and people who are influence, influential on us, my hope and prayer is that part of our thinking of these significant ladies in our journey is that they turn to Proverbs 31 and, and there's something about the virtuous woman that conveys something in our, in our person's life that we love and we, we respect. When we look at Proverbs 31, we, we see some pretty significant pieces of the story of, of life, of faith, and that nature. And I want you to read in verse 25 of Proverbs 31. The scripture says she's clothed with strength and dignity and she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instructions on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed and her husband also and he praises her. Many women do noble and noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her words bring her praise at the city gate. As you hear those words, as you read those words, I hope there is somebody in your life that you think about when you see them that they come to your mind, that they, they are a, a figment of your thoughts when you're reading this. And, if, and, and for you ladies who are thinking of your grandmother and your mother and your aunt or your teacher or your mentor, whoever it might be, you might be the face associated with your child, your grandchild, your friend's thoughts when they read this. You might be that person that they are thinking about because of your impact on their life. When we see this story, there are some significant pieces of who this woman is. She's clothed with strength and dignity. What does that mean? That means that as she goes about her business at home, at work, in the community, wherever it is, whatever she might do, be doing, that she is seen as a person of, of strength, of character. That you see a woman who has faithful wisdom and it's faithful instruction on her tongue that people go to her to, for advice, that they want to hear what she has to say about children, about education, about business, about whatever it might be in this journey, that she's responsible, that she does her job, whatever her job might be, that she's respected, not just by her immediate family, by her children and her spouse, but she's respected by other persons in her community, the people she works with, the people in her school, the people she goes to church with. She is a respected person because of the way she carries herself, that she is a woman of faith. Guys, you think about what that looks like in this journey. On Wednesday night, I had a lady in our Bible study. She said, please pray for me. My muscle disorder has, has come back and I'm leaning on God. And she, I asked her a little bit later what was going on, and she told me, she told me what it looked like and the challenges, and she said it with a smile. She said it with joy. She said it with strength. You could see the faith being born out in her story as she was facing this, as she is facing this. The Miller family, we prayed for your mother so many times in the last months. It's just, we're just heartbroken that she did not make it. But her faith was one of the pieces we talked about time and again in the midst of her hurt and the sorrow and the struggle. We talked about the faith that was, she was embodying and modeling for us. Now, I'm not going to give you a family pictorial history, but I, I do want to show you one picture of my mom and dad. My mom and dad were, are, were married. They were World War II veterans. They got married after a blind date and two weeks of dating in 1946. 
They were married in 46. They had my oldest brother in 1948. They had my sister in 1950. They had my other brother in 1952. In 1966, I came into the picture. My dad wanted to name me. Holy cow, what's this? And uh, the doctor wouldn't sign the birth certificate. He said that's too long. But anyway... My mom and dad lived a very basic life. My dad ran a gas station from 1939 until he retired in 1985. He was in service for four years during, 40, during World War II. My mom grew up on a farm. She grew up with two brothers. Her mother passed away when she was a little girl. Very simple life. When her brother came back from Pearl Harbor after being blown up in the Japanese attack there, she took care of my brother for a year or two, and then she joined the Army Nurse Corps, became an RN, and went off to serve in the Philippines, taking care of soldiers, American soldiers who'd been held prisoner in Japanese prisoner of war camps, taking care of soldiers who'd been just decimated by the, the ravages of war. She went to work after that, serving in, a, uh, serving in a, a small country hospital, and did that from 1946 until she retired in 1992. She retired in 1992 to take care of my father, who was dying of COPD. If you don't know what COPD is, that is a respiratory distress disease where he just could not breathe. Air just did not flood his lungs, did not fill his lungs, and it was a very long and slow and a difficult demise for my father. During those eight years that my mom was, was taking care of my dad, she had one outlet that I do not recommend. She listened to talk radio, specifically Rush Limbaugh. She loved Rush Limbaugh, and when she would listen to Rush Limbaugh, she would just get all wired up and so anxious and so agitated and so irritated with this country. It was, it was fascinating to hear her talk about what was going on. I had no idea my mom was so politically astute or whatever you want to say. But for eight years, while she's taking care of my dad in a very difficult spot, listening to that kind of information, she got to be rather negative. She got to be rather bitter about life and some other things, and it was just, just the way things happened. When my father passed away in September of 2000, my mom turned Rush off, thank the Lord, and she turned on some religious programming, and she started listening to a guy by the name of Charles Stanley, T.D. Jakes, Adrian Rogers, other, other persons that she would hear the story, of, and she just started changing. And one of the things that changed in my mom's attitude was the way in which she found things to be thankful for. One of my mom's favorite sayings was this, Thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Would you say that out loud with me, please? Thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Invariably, moms get phone calls from their children and grandchildren when life is not good. When things are going difficult with any of her kids, when things were going troubling with some of her grandchildren, with other people that she was caring for, people would call my mom and ask for wisdom and advice and, and direction and those types of things. And one of the things my mom said to all of us over and over and over again was that simple expression, thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Now, after 10 days of rain, how many of you were thankful to see the sunshine today? Yes, exactly. We were thankful to see that. But in my mom's message, it wasn't about the sun because it could have been cloudy or snowing or raining or it could have been the midnight when she would say, thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. What was she doing? She was encouraging us to find something in our story to be thankful for, to find something in our life to be positive for, to find something that we could recognize God had blessed us with something. In the midst of our hurt, in the midst of our struggle, God was doing something somewhere. There's enough negative and ugly and bitter stuff in this world, dealing with politics, dealing with finance, dealing with jobs, dealing with some broken family stuff, that we can be negative easy. It's a challenge to find something to say thank you, Lord, for. Psalm 32, 11, it says this. Read this out loud with me, please. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous sing, all of you who are upright in heart. Do you hear the message of followers of Christ? Do you hear this message, people of the book? Do you hear this message, people of the way? You're going to have bad days. I'm going to have bad days. You're going to have terrible days. We're going to have days that are going to change the trajectory of our life. But not every day. Not every day is going to be like that. Not every day is going to be nasty and negative. And we have this tendency and this propensity that we can live with this bitter, sour attitude on our face and in our hearts and in our lives that is not, not pleasant. Thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. It means finding things to be thankful for in our journey that are happening in your life in a beautiful way that we sometimes miss. 
The scripture says this in Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, you may not have anything. You may not have anything to be thankful for. Your job may stink. Your marriage may be on the rocks. Your children may not call you today. You may have untold issues going on that I am not aware and my heart breaks and my heart grieves for you. But I know this, God loves you. God really, really does have a plan for you. God really wants you to get connected with him and doing his work for his purpose to change this world. I know that. There is something in this world that you can say, thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Second piece that my mom had to say. I, my mom, I want, I want to say this. My mom was not the most graceful lady. She did not go to finishing school. She grew up on a farm in southern Illinois. She took care of an uncle with some grievous wounds. She went to, went to war in the Philippines and saw things that we don't even want to think about. She, she just wasn't real graceful. My mom grew up on, in southern Illinois where the only time you ate oysters was at Christmas when you had oyster stew and the oysters came out of a can. And those of you who know what oysters are, you think that's kind of crazy, but that was the one time a year she got them. When she was about 80 years old, Veronica had a meeting in Georgetown and Veronica and Lauren and myself were spending the night in a really nice hotel and, and a friend of ours came up and picked us up and he was going to take, take us to a nice steakhouse in Alexandria called Morton's and we were getting ready to go to this place and my mom said, do you think they'll have oysters there? I love oysters. And my friend said, nope, but we're going to go someplace that does. And he turned around and we walked into this spot in Old Town, Alexandria. And when you walk into this restaurant in Old, Old Town, you, you might have been there. They've got a, a window where there's a man inside who's shucking the oysters. And we're walking in. My, I show my mom. I said, Mom, what do, you, what do you think about these oysters? And she said, David, those aren't oysters. Those are rocks. I said, Mom, those are oysters. And she said, David, those are rocks. And I tapped on the window and I asked the fellow, I said, show me the oyster. So he cut one open and he picked up the oyster and my mom looked at me and she said, I had no idea oysters came from rocks. And it was just a great thing. We were sitting down and this is a fancy restaurant, linen tablecloth. Our, all of our tables had a, had a waitress. This is an expensive place, so obviously I'm not paying for it. And uh, we're having a, having a great meal. And my friend, he orders, he orders fried oysters for the table and a platter of calamari. And when we're sitting down to eat the oysters, my mom's tearing those up, and she sees the calamari, so she starts getting into the calamari, and she asks me mid-bite, she says, David, what is this? And I said, Mom, it's calamari. And she said, Dad, David, what's calamari? And I said, octopus. And she did this, <laughs> all across the table. The guy in the tuxedo looks at her and says, that's never happened here before. My friend who was paying his eyes got his biggest silver dollars, and he's like, what is going on? And I said, my mom doesn't like calamari. So my mom wasn't the most graceful person in the world at that point. There were times I would call my mom, and my mom would give me more information than I wanted to know. I'd say, mom, what are you doing? And, well, I'm taking a bath, and I'd hear the water splish splashing around. I'd say, well, mom, what are you doing? Well, I'm eating breakfast, and I'd hear the spoon on the bowl. Mom, what are you doing? Well, you don't want to know the rest of that. And so... My mom goes shopping with my sister and sister-in-law in St. Louis, and while they're shopping in St. Louis, my mom at this point's 81, and uh, she, uh, she's done shopping. Sister and sister-in-law, far from done shopping, she says, I want to go outside in the car. They say, Mom, why don't you sit in the, sit in the bench? Nope. I want to sit in the car. It's a pretty day, sun shining, out in the car. So they go out the car, they lower the windows, and my mom sits in the front seat. She's sitting there for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Who knows how long she's sitting there, and she decides time to get out of this car. So she goes to open the door, and for whatever reason, the child safety locks prevented my mother from opening the door. And so, boom, 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 and boom, 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 and she can't crawl the back seat, so she's getting a little panicked. And, and her prayer was, Lord, get me out of this car. And so my mom, being a crafty person, windows down, she takes her right leg, and she puts her right leg outside the window, she takes her left leg, puts her left leg out the window, wiggles her body so she's seated on top of the door outside of my sister's SUV, 81 years old, and she says, Lord, don't let me break a hip, and she jumps down. Now, my sister and sister-in-law are both nurses. They were horrified that my mother did that. I thought it was one of the greatest things ever that she was that brave and that courageous to step up and do something like that. I want you to think about this. 
When we look at this text in Psalm 34, verse 8, there's a text that says this in, in the Psalms. It says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those of you who fear him like nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Friends, my mother was teaching us in that prayer dependence, trust in God during a critical time. Yes, it was kind of crazy that she crawled out of the car like that, but she was showing us something. I received an email this week from a lady in our congregation named Christina. Christina and her husband are from Liberia. And I want you to hear what Christina wrote me this week. She wrote, During the Civil War in my country between 1989 and 2003, I prayed a lot as expected. I believe people who didn't even have a religion prayed at that time. I was glad that I was a Christian because my relationship with God played a major role in my survival of the war. Two popular prayers that I and many other Christians praised often were the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. The 23rd Psalm recited during heavy fighting and shootings when we were either fleeing from it, living in it, or lying awake at night and praying to live to see daylight or running in the midst of heavy battles. The most commonly prayed verse was, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I needed assurance in God's protection. For the Lord's Prayer, the most commonly prayed verse was, Give us this day our daily bread. The reason? Why did we pray that so often? Because many times during the heat of war, there was almost always absolutely no food anywhere. Nothing in storage, nothing in the cabinets, nothing anywhere in the place where you lived. You had no food and your neighbors had no food. Each day was another day to pray again and again for food and for protection. It was another day to start all over again to look for and fetch some food somewhere. And when you got something for eating late in the evening or night, that was it. But it was sufficient. I wish Christina was the only person in this congregation that's gone through something like that. But I know in a room like this, there are a lot of people who have struggled with the very foundations of life. And they have prayed that prayer. I talk about my mom getting out of a car. But there are some people in this room who have endured heartache and hardship that we can learn from in significant and substantial ways and how they have managed to, to work through these pieces. And I, I believe in Philippians chapter 4, the Scripture says, And my God will meet all of your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I am worried about our nation. I'm worried about our nation's future. I'm worried about what my daughter's going to do when she graduates college. I worry about college graduates that are finishing school and trying to find jobs. I worry about these things. I just do. I know I'm not supposed to, but I do. But part of my journey of faith is trust and dependence and understanding that God is in control. And with God being in control, we can keep going forward. We can climb out of tight spots. We will make it through some difficult places. I think my mom's message of, Lord, get me out of this car, can also help us as we seek to get out of some difficult spots in our life. Third thing that my mom said that's pretty significant. Would you repeat this out loud with me, please? If you can look up, you can get up. This is a message title from T.D. Jakes, and my mother loved T.D. Jakes. She shared this with us so many times. She shared this with us when we were going through good days and bad days. We sh shared this with us when bills were tight and money was short. She shared this with us so many times, we almost said to our mom, please stop telling me if I can look up, I can get up. Sometimes you just want to whine and cry and waller in your mess. But my mom always had this message of, impressing others and encouraging others and pushing, pushing us on. When you look at this text in Psalm 3, one of the pieces of dealing with stress is found in that fifth verse. And the scripture says, I lie down and sleep and I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I told you several months ago that I had a niece who made a boatload of bad choices by the time she was 15 she began, got pregnant for the first time when she was 14. She had 
three little boys by the time she was 20. She was doing things with drugs and other things we just won't go and get into. Everybody in our family had given up on this kid. Her mom, her dad, her aunts, her uncles, everybody. The little boys were farmed out to different family members, but it was a terrible time. There was one person who would not give up on her. My mom. I thought she was enabling her, but the reality is she stood beside her. Four days after my mother passed away, my niece graduated with her degree in, in nursing, and she, she manages two nursing homes to this day and doing fabulous, fabulous work. She said to that kid hundreds and hundreds of times, if you can look up, you can get up. And what I want to say to you who are hurting, who are struggling, who are in pain, when you're in your car, when you're at home, when you come to the altar and when you pray, when you're struggling and you feel like there is no direction that you can go, if you can look up, God's going to hear your hurt and your cry and he's going to help you get up. Don't quit. Don't stop in the midst of a divorce, in the midst of child struggles, in the midst of work, in the midst of grief or pain or whatever. Don't quit. Don't quit. September 2004 was the beginning of one of the darkest periods of my life. In September of 2004, I made a decision at my church in Amherst to address a difficult manner. It did not go well. It, it, it went so bad, life was miserable at that church for the next year. From September 2004 until August 5th, 2005, I didn't sleep a single night through. Life was nasty. Life was bad. It was just an unpleasant, unpleasant time. I can't tell you the number of times my mom would call and just check in and see, David, how are you doing? How are you holding up? And mom, I just hate this. I wanted to leave the ministry. I didn't want to be a pastor anymore. I wanted to get out of that business. And when we finally got connected with Tappahannock, I told Veronica, I said, Veronica, if this doesn't work, if this doesn't happen, I'm done. I'll sell cars. I'll be a history teacher. I'll do whatever it is that I need to do, but I, I can't put us through this again. Time and again, my mom stood by our side praying and hoping and act, asking for God's grace and mercy. And we landed in Tappahannock in August of 2005. My first night in Tappahannock was the first night I slept in almost a year. She called us one day, and this, this was the view outside of our house in Tappahannock. That was outside of our window. That was Christmas Eve morning, uh, 2005. She called us one day, and she said, she said, David, what are you doing? And I said, Mom, I, I was looking out that window at that point. There's a swimming pool to the right you can't see. I said, I'm watching Lauren swim, and she's swimming with some friends. And as she swim with some friends, there's a, there's a tree with an, a bald eagle on top of it. And I'm listening to this eagle scream and cry. And I said, Veronica's in the kitchen. She's getting ready to make a meal for a bunch of friends who are coming over tonight. And I said, Mom, things are really good. We're having a great day. I said, Mom, what are, what are you doing? And you remember how I said when you ask your mom that, she tells you? You know what she said? She said, David, I'm on my knees praying for you. And God just said, you're okay. You think about that. She was 83 at this point, on her knees, praying. And God just said, you're okay. I stood at that view and cried like a baby. I was just shy of 40, had just landed in this place, and I had a mother who had stood by my side during a very dark spot. Praying, hoping, helping. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, you got some people in your life that you need to stand in the gap for. To pray, to love, to offer hope, help, healing, life. I don't know what it is, but that's something for all of us. Final piece, and we'll wrap it up. On December 1st, 2006, I was at a football game with my favorite coach, who happens to be sitting right here. We were in Goochland, Virginia. We were getting ready to play for the state championship or the game right before the state championship. We had a Division I running back. He was phenomenal. I thought we had this game in the tank and we were going to go to the championship, and it was not to be. Halftime of that game, I got a call from my sister. And uh, she said, David, mom's fallen. She's broken her pelvis. She's okay. 
but she's in the hospital. I said, okay, okay. I said, do I need to come home now? No. Do I need to come home tomorrow? It's tomorrow Sunday. No. Come home Monday. I said, okay. So we finished the game and left the field and went home, and I made arrangements to fly home on Monday and flew home on Monday. And uh, the final statement is this. Pray until there's a smile on my face. Flew into St. Louis, drove to the hospital in Mount Vernon, got to the hospital in Mount Vernon. First time I've ever seen my mom in the hospital. First time she'd been in the hospital since I was born. And uh, so it's been 40 years at this point. So she's sitting in the bed. My sister's talking to her. My brother-in-law's talking to her. My niece and my nephew are talking to her. And she's holding court. She's all excited because the next day we're taking her home. She's going to my sister's house. She's going to have a hospital bed. We've got the porta potty in the house. and got everything ready to take her home for rehab and recovery. So she's happy, happy, happy. Sister leaves, brother-in-law leaves, nieces and nephews leave, and I just stay there for the next two hours. And while I'm talking to my mom, we're talking about this, that, and the other, Lauren, Veronica, life, church, all the good things that go on in life. And then after those two hours, Bill, you're going to understand this, I was struggling with, do I be the pastor or do I be the son? And I finally said, Mom, do you want me to pray for you before I go? And she looked at me, and she held out her hand, and she said, pray until there's a smile on my face. So I held her hand and I prayed with her and gave her a kiss on the forehead. She smiled, said, I love you, Mom. I left. And two hours later, she had a massive heart attack and that was it. She was gone. The last thing my mother said to me were those words, pray until there's a smile on my face. She taught us a little bit about trust. Trust trusting God in some difficult spots and difficult places. She lost her mother when she was nine years old. She took care of a wounded brother when she was 19. She was taking care of American soldiers when she was 22. She raised a family on a shoestring in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. She had children in her house for 40 years. She was a person who people could look at, and I saw this beautiful tapestry of her life, and I see these four statements Thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Thanks, thankful. Lord, get me out of this car trusting. I see this picture over and again of her faith encouraging us and me. And I think about you. In the tapestry that is your life, how do you need to be a blessing to your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, whoever it might be? I don't know. But I know this. There is power, moms and dads, in your example. Travis and Jen Crowder, I'm a friend with them on Facebook, and I watched them do a workout one day, and I watched Travis and Jen doing all this stuff, and then I watched their little boy trying to keep up with mom and dad. Mom and dad, there's stuff for you to show your kids, good stuff to show your kids, powerful stuff, and let me encourage you to be that person of influence in your child, your grandchild, whoever it might be's life. Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we conclude things this morning, my hope and my prayer is that you would speak to every mom and dad in this room, aunt and uncle, grandma and grandpa, friend, teacher, Sunday school teacher, whoever we might be that has an impact and an influence on people's lives, that we might recognize the impact that we have to change life for the better. Speak to our hearts, Father, in such a way that we point people to Christ. We point people to Jesus in such a way that they find hope and direction and purpose and meaning. Help us, Father God, to recognize the incredible impact we have on our families. Father, speak to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.